it's going, it's thinking, it's live. All right, so hey everybody, it's Ashley Soske, Pediatric Emergency Mom, and today we're doing one of our fun Facebook Lives for kids, and um, joined today by my good friend, Dr. Chip Angston, who is a pedi, nope, not a PC. <laughs> So he's the same pediatric. <laughs> Brad, um, who is an orthopedic surgeon. So that means he works on the bones and the muscles and the things that help us move. Um, and he's also one of the or the orthopedic surgeon for the same. And so kids can ask him um, whatever they would like. We've been doing these chips so far just to let you know we've had um myself a geologist a dentist an immunologist an army ranger a vascular wow. surgeon and a veterinarian wow that's a that's an assortment of, of occupations that's awesome right yeah so we've had um we've had a lot jack can i have your phone are you you're, on you're on man i, was just I know can i have your phone what's in here well we always have technical difficulties every time we do this. That's and the dream yard, it looks pretty, pretty slick. Yeah, it did. We it took Jack and I, I don't know how long to try to figure out how to do this. And then um, Jack's cousin in Pittsburgh said, "Hey, oh here you go, Jack." Said, "Hey, why don't you try this?" And um, and and it worked. So awesome. Okay, so I was trying to get. So I'm watching on here so I can get. Um, people's names. So the first person that said, Hey, Chip, is Dana Thibodeau Lee. Hey, Dana T. Hey, Chip. And um, and so we have a few people joining and watching. So, so Dr. Chip, I have some questions for you. My first question is, um, so when you do orthopedic residency, you decide at some point during that time to you to do general orthopedics or to specialize. So do you have a specialty and how did you decide on your specialty? Well, I, I trained, I did my training for residency in Birmingham at the University of Alabama, Birmingham's program. I, I was there from 2003 to 2008. And during that period of time, it's usually around your th third year of residency. Um, that's when you start having to decide whether or not you, want to do some type of subspecialty training. So there's a lot of, di there's about seven or eight different subspecialties within orthopedics. So somebody can specialize in foot and ankle surgery or specialize in hip and knee replacement or uh, orthopedic oncology dealing with tumors and uh, funny bumps uh, and cancer from an orthopedic standpoint. And so during my third year of residency, I, I worked with a group of surgeons in Birmingham that had a pretty big sports medicine practice. Um, a number of doctors, Dr. Larry Lemack and James Andrews and Lyle Kane and Jeff Dugas. And they were my first kind of real doctors that really pushed me into the world of sports medicine and opened my eyes to, to really how, how much I loved it. So after that experience, I decided I wanted to do sports medicine, and that's how I just kind of moved my track down to further subspecialty training in sports medicine. So I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I'm board certified in orthopedic surgery, and uh, I had an extra certification and training specifically in sports medicine, so mainly taking care of patients that are just active. I mean, people that are trying to get back to an active lifestyle, whether they're middle schoolers on a soccer field or 50 year olds on a soccer field, people still have very uh, you know, significant injuries. It, it's a little different when you're dealing with kids and young people compared to older people, but it's still the same active lifestyle that I, that I, I manage and try to help patients with their injuries, get back to the things they'd love to do. Yeah. And you're really good at it. Cause uh, let's see, Jack was maybe 35 when he tore his bicep tendon. And yep. so his right biceps are the, the two muscles here in your arm, on the front part of your arm. Yep, and yep. so even though I told Dr. Jack to try to pick this TV up, what did he do? He picked the TV up. Yep. 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 And, and so Chip is super athletic. I mean, there are situations where there's there's not the most graceful uh injuries that we take care of, but that's part of orthopedics. So are you talking about my knee injury? Is that what you're talking about? I'm talking about the picking up a television, you know. 
unless you're watching sports on television. So. Yeah. Or um, or stepping up and tearing your ACL, right? Like I did. Yes. yes. And, Correct. and Dr. Kim said, Ashley, you might need surgery. And I said, nope. <laughs> I'm doing it. But that's yeah. all right. Me and Oh, no, most most sports medicine doctors um, deal with shoulder and elbow and knee conditions, but there's some that also deal with sports medicine injuries and or sports related injuries in the foot and ankle or the hip or even the spine. So, but most sports medicine trained doctors take care of those kind of joints, shoulders, elbows, and knees. Cool. So for those of you guys just joining us, I'm talking to Dr. Chip, who is an orthopedic surgeon. He does sports medicine and he is the orthopedic surgeon for the Saints. Um, and so kids can ask him whatever they would like. We're kind of using this um, for parents to not only teach about science and medicine, but maybe give parents a little bit of a break. Sure. And so we consider I this uh, crisis schooling, right, is what we're calling it. Um, so I'm sure everybody wants to know. And so I'll ask, since no kids have asked yet, how is it working with the Saints? Oh, it's great. It really is. I mean, it's, a, a I think, a really well-run organization. And, um, you know, everybody's excited to be there and really works hard. And so when you see the, the group of people coming together, where they be just not just the athletes, but the trainers and the administration from the people that, scout potential free agents to people who are getting ready to draft uh, players coming out of college. They all work really hard and they're all good people. And that that's, that's been really, really just a, a very rewarding uh, portion of my, my day-to-day -day life. Um, I've been taking care of them since 2017 and, and it's a lot of work. It's a lot of travel. It is some time away from my family, which is hard. Um, but it, it really is, Quite rewarding and, and enjoyable. That's really cool. What is the um, so these are things that I like to know that maybe people like um, parents like Jack probably don't want to know. Sure. And he's going to probably walk away. But what what is your favorite surgery to do? I like taking care of knee ligament injuries. That's probably my, my favorite kind of group of surgeries, whether they be things like ACL injuries or when people dislocate their knees and have multi-ligament injuries. There's some complex knee injuries that occur where you basically can dislocate your knee and reconstructing those are, you know, challenging and, you know, you have to be pretty focused and, and uh, I work with another partner most of the time. And so it's an opportunity to do something challenging and work with a colleague. And that part really is, is fun. What's your least favorite surgery to do? Oh, nobody wants that. to take care. nobody wants to take care of infection, whether it be somebody who develops an abscess or kind of an infection deep under the skin, or a post-surgical infection. And unfortunately, part of surgery is is main is dealing with when things sometimes don't go perfect, and when the infection happens post-surgically, even though it's quite rare, is, is probably the most uh, disappointing thing for the patients and the surgeon. So I would say out of all the things is uh, taking care of surgery wise is dealing with some type of an infection. I don't, I don't like those. We try to avoid them at all costs and do everything we can to prevent them. But still sometimes even, even when you do everything yeah. right, still bad things can happen. Right. Right. Um, okay. So Janine Abair says, Hey, Dr. Bankston, you fixed up my knee too. Okay. And Allison Grabois says, thanks for fixing Drew Brees. Oh, goodness. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, and so <laughs> that's great. Um, can I ask, and I don't know if people like this or not, but these are the things that I want to know. Sure. What is the grossest thing you've ever seen? Oh, man. Um, like a bad break or... A dislocation. You probably see those all the time. A regular day. You know, I, I, when I trained in Birmingham, another one of the doctors I worked with a lot, he considered himself the team doctor for the interstate. Uh, he oh. took care of a lot of interstate related injuries and people having bad wrecks. There's three interstate, three, you know, interstates that go through Birmingham. And so there was a lot of interstate and, uh, motor vehicle trauma that came through. Oh. Anytime somebody has, has, 
their arm out the window and they have a rollover injury in a car. These terrible fractures with bad road rash is just awful, bad, bad injury. Wear your seatbelts, people, and, and definitely don't drink and drive. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Bad things happen. Bad things yeah. happen. I posted um, the other day, there's an Instagram that's called Medical Talks. It's amazing, but they share a lot of graphic images sometimes. And so they're covered and you can uncover them. And there was a degloving injury recently. It was. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty, pretty early. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to keep up with who is commenting. So it's, it's a little bit hard. So Candace Hardy says. Hunter is seven years old. He wants to know, quote, what is the most craziest injury you have had to take care of on a football player? That's from Hunter. He's seven. Oh, my goodness. The craziest injury. Uh, it seems like there's always something unique that happens. I mean, let me think about that for a minute. I think you know, I've, seen, I, I've seen players just basically – the same same injuries that other other people in the community would have with 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 very minimal trauma i mean I, we had a player last year who literally just had a running back just bounce into him and had just the strangest fracture in his forearm um i've seen uh patients and players that have had really significantly um stretched out knees that that end up having a bad blood blood injury or blood vessel injury um just wild things and people recover from some of the worst injuries that are just it's when you're when you're dealing with athletes whether it be college or professional these players they they oftentimes can recover faster than the rest of us and bad injuries don't hurt them as, as badly it's, it's it's a real real unique skill set to be able to withstand bad bad big trauma in the world of football and recover from it faster than just the average Joe. Do you, so Danny Miller asked um, what medical facilities or equipment are available at the Superdome? Are they shared by both teams and are similar facilities and equipment available? Like when you play in a away game, I think that's a great question. Like how much can you do at the Superdome versus well, having to go to a hospital? I'll, I'll start with <laughs> you know, you know, There's a lot of, uh, physicians and medical staff on the field at any one time during a, a professional game or NFL game. We, I would just say on our sideline at the saints facility, we've got three orthopedic surgeons, one internal medicine doctor, one nurse who's kind of the head nurse for Toro uh, emergency room. We've got an ophthalmologist, a spine doctor, an uh, ENT, uh, somebody who's an ER doctor who manages airway issues or can run a code if there's a problem. Neurosurgeons that work, work as neurotrauma consultants. And um, they're, they're really just the mirror image of that is on the other sideline. And then there's other neurosurgeons that are in the booth and other athletic trainers. We've got on our sideline, two physical therapists, six athletic trainers, one nutritionist. It's just a host of people that are part of kind of a medical crew that come together. And so from in terms of facilities that are at the Superdome, we have we have X-ray. Um, we have the ability to, if we had to do something like intubate a patient on the field, we have an emergency doctor and a, a crew of EMS people that are there that we practice every year for these we call emergency action plans. In case there is something, somebody that needs to be put on a spine board or is, has cardiac arrest or has a problem maintaining their airway, and so. There's things that we can do if need be emergently on the field. And there's things that we can do off the field where there's x-ray and putting people in splints or casts. And every, uh, every NFL uh, club or really every NFL stadium has to have a level one trauma center affiliated with it for any injuries. And so if somebody had a bad enough injury, um, uh, most people realize this is, this is public knowledge. It's not HIPAA related stuff, but, there was a tight end from Chicago Bears a few years ago who had a very bad knee injury, and had a bad knee dislocation with a blood vessel injury, and he ended up having to go emergently for surgery at University Medical Center, the old kind of what I consider the old charity hospital, University Medical Center. Um, 
and we have to have people that are available for that all the time. And that also helps that we have the chief medical officer for University Medical Center is there on the sideline for 90%, 80% of our games. And so there's a, there is a a real concerted effort to try to keep these players healthy to, to prevent injury. But there's also a very concerted effort if there is an injury to deal with it aggressively and fast and to make it as safe of a game as possible. So I don't know if that, that answers the question. And each yeah. stadium has a little, little difference in terms of what they can do. Some, a couple stadiums do have MRIs on in their stadium. Um, and a, a few people or a few stadiums have hospitals that are, you know, if you're going to be in New York City, you've got, it takes probably to go from where the, the new stadium is in New Jersey to get to some of the trauma centers affiliated with it. It could be a 45 minute drive or a helicopter. So it's not always just a five minute walk to University Medical Center like it is at uh, the Superdome. There's other situations where you potentially have to have, have a little bit of a prolonged transport but you need it. It's part of the deal for, you have to have a level one trauma center in case somebody has a bad spinal cord injury or cardiac event or um, any type of kind of life or limb injury. You know, I didn't even, you said ophthalmology and for the kids, if they don't know that that's an eye surgeon and I didn't even think about that, but you're, if you get a hand in a face mask and gouge an eye, that's, that could be pretty bad. Seems like a couple of times each year throughout the season, we'll have during a game, somebody, takes a finger to the eye and you know it's important if they have a corneal abrasion or if they have some significant you know globe injury you really you need to know that pretty soon it can really affect their game and obviously their their uh, livelihood absolutely um sherry shetler kramer i know has two boys and so she wants to know what made you become a doctor what age did you decide to enter the medical field and did you play sports growing up so I'll kind of take a few of those and meld them together. I was, so I swam growing up. I swam here in Baton Rouge. I was part of Bengal Tiger Aquatic Club, which no longer is in existence. They now call it Tiger Aquatics. And so I swam through college and was part of the LSU men's and women's swimming ballroom team. And I swam throughout those four years of college. And so, you know, part of being around, athletics especially at the collegiate level is you're around a lot of athletic trainers and in and out of the training room when there's injuries or bumps or bruises and so i i entered into the world of sciences thinking that maybe i wanted to do something in the world of medicine and then as i started to get more exposed to kind of the world of sports medicine one of my cousin at the team uh, is now the team the team doctor for lsu since the early 90s so when i was in college at lsu I uh, kind of interacted with him a little bit and decided, you know what, if I, if I want to potentially go and consider the world of medicine, I probably ought to work in the physician's office. So for the summer of 97, I worked with my cousin, uh, my third cousin, Brent Bankston, as kind of one of his student workers. And I, I just loved it. You know, I, I really love the ability of um, taking, I like the idea of taking care of healthy patients involved in sports, sports related injuries, but I really loved also just how, how rewarding it is to have a patient who has terrible problems, whether they be arthritis in their knee or their shoulder or their hip, and you can really affect their quality of life just so tremendously by, by doing something surgically. So somebody who couldn't walk without severe pain, all of a sudden you can help them walk again. And it's so rewarding to see the patients just be so happy and take away that pain. And, and it's not just rewarding for the patients, but it's really rewarding for me. And so, that, that kind of is the world, how I started into the world of medicine. I thought that maybe I wanted to do it and I wanted to see what it was like to be around patients and to take care of patients and working with my cousin allowed me to do that. And I just, you know, I thought, Oh, here's the team doctor for LSU. I'm just going to take care of a bunch of athletes all summer. And it's really not the case. There's very few practices that just take care of athletes all the time. And you really, you know, most of orthopedics is taking care of parents and grandparents who who've got bumps and bruises and injuries and, arthritis that that really if you can manage that and help them it can be uh removing lifelong pain which is again very rewarding so i hope that that answered the question yeah for sure and if this is a, my question if you were not an orthopedist is there another specialty that was would have been your second i i you know i 
I, I really, there's a couple other specialties that I was thinking of outside of orthopedics. If I decided to do medicine, I'd like procedural based things. Um, <laughs> excuse me. Um, I like procedural based things. Um, I like the world of urology. Um, they had some interesting surgeries involved there. I like the world of pediatric cardiology. I thought that there were some interesting, um, <laughs> some interesting procedures or pediatric cardiac cardiac surgery. I had some friends that were involved with that. Yeah, yeah. I did. So I don't know if you know. I did four months of a pediatric cardiology fellowship. Oh my and god! And that was not the happiest time in my life. I love the people that I worked with, but that was not my specialty. So yeah. Look, I, I, I entered the world of medicine thinking I wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon. I just knew I had to work hard to get there and study hard. And, and you know, I was fortunate enough to make things do well in school and get this job I needed. And here I am. So keep studying. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Lifelong yeah. learning, you know? Sorry, <laughs> these guys. Um, yeah, I I love ortho. I think if um, there I feel like that guy, you know, the really important guy who's trying to do like the interview and his kids coming in and the, and the sitter like oh yeah tries yeah. to come and snag the kid. Sure. That's what I like. Right. Except that right. my helper is not. Helping me. My, door. my door got locked when I walked into this room. I should have done that. Um, no, I love orthopedics. And I think now in retrospect and doing everything that we do in the ER with kids and injuries, just going to pretend like he's not here. Yeah. Um, when people ask me, I say ortho. Like if I, if I wouldn't do pediatric emergency medicine, I really like ortho. I like the dislocations and the fractures and it's very satisfying. Yeah, I mean, um, it's it's. I like taking care of a relatively healthy patient population, and you know, just a little bit more about me. I, I was, I, I did not like the world of death and dying. It just was not, you know, I, I did not like the taking care of an unhealthy population that was, was really sick. And uh, most orthopedics is taking care of patients who need pain relieved or function restored. And I thought that that was, was really for me, the, the just the best, best path forward for medicine in general and orthopedics just fit that perfectly. And you get to work with other doctors often because like you mentioned um, the Chicago injury, when he um, dislocated his knee, right? You have a lot of blood vessels that run behind your knee. So when you do that surgery, you work with a vascular surgeon, with a surgeon that works on blood vessels? Well, you know, part of the reason for having a level one trauma center connected with each NFL stadium is so that they have everything there. So if there is some vascular injury, it's immediate, there are consultants there and doctors there immediately available. And so, although, you know, I, I didn't, I wasn't, I did not perform any procedures on the patient that we're talking about or player we talked about. Um, but we were, you know, involved with tra making sure he was transferred to the proper facility, got the care he needed at university medical center. Um, you know, it, it is, you know, part of medicine is you're, you're, you're not in a bubble, even a pathologist who looks at slides still has to interact with other physicians and, clinical laboratory people. And, and so if part of the world of medicine in general is being able to effectively communicate, collaborate, and people who can't do that can't be what do what we do. Just can't do it. Just won't work. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Do it respectfully. You should do it respectfully too. I mean, That's right. So Dr. Chip and I talk about this all the time. You should always talk to people the way you would want people to talk to you. And so, um, being understanding unless it's, kid, unless it's your kids in the background trying to yeah. run around with kids. he is he's at least wearing underwear yeah. Yeah. <laughs> looks like he's naked he's not he's at least wearing underwear um okay set up you kind of fun questions okay um what do you think is harder being an orthopedic surgeon or a stay-at-home parent now that <laughs> oh my gosh now that this now we're in, a, in an area of time where we're getting quarantined and social distanced at home, man, I, 
I think it's so rewarding to be with your kids more for me. I, I have a period of time, almost five months where I'm, I'm not around as much as I'd like to be. And I, I will tell you, it's more challenging to probably be a stay at home parent. You know, kids teach you the world of patience and it's so important to, to learn from them. And I, I feel like I can learn something from them every day outside of this, the, the joy of life, but also the world of being patient as a parent. Um, and look, at you got to be very patient and very loving to be a stay-at-home parent. Yeah. It is for me. It is easier to run a level one trauma <laughs> than to keep my kids separated and learning and getting along yeah. in this time. It is like so many kudos to stay-at-home parents and to teachers. Wow, this is so cool. I mean, look, you're seeing all these ways that you know, I think this is the hardest part about dealing with this COVID-19 stuff is, is the issue of, of distance, distance from other loved ones, distance from friends, distance from the network of, of struggles and anxiety. And, you know, doing these types of, you know, broadcast and when you're seeing teachers post things from even preschool saying, oh, you should do this with your kids. And man, it's, it, it really is even though it's difficult for us to be a part as a community, it is really neat that there is some way that we can somehow connect and still try to do some things together. And this is a, you're, what you're doing is really neat, actually. Yeah. Oh, thank you. No, we've, um, we can, I feel like I've connected back to my childhood um, in a lot of ways. So Henry will say, why are you just laying in the grass? When I was little, I just loved to lay in the grass. And so even though I have a killer on the allergies, I don't care. I'm going to take the hit and I'm going to go lay in the grass because it makes me feel better. Um, another, so for everybody that's watching, because Chip, we've kind of had in between 20 and 40 people watching at any time. Kids can ask Dr. Chip whatever they would like. I've been asking him some funny questions. Some good questions, but some funny yeah. ones too. Yeah. That is um, the guardian angel making sure that you're listening to mom. Yeah. He really is the guardian angel. I'm not lying to you. Um, if you could have any superpower, what would it be? That's a hard one. Oh, I love the idea of time travel. Uh, I think that's wow, so okay. Yeah. Maybe. Okay. For, or maybe that's because one of the more recent books I've been reading with my kids is Dragons Love Tacos 2, the sequel. And there's, there's space time. I feel like they got a little crazy with that one. but Yeah, yeah I think it was, yeah. it was pretty cool. Yeah, it was it was pretty cool. Yeah, you, you, time travel, I think, is pretty neat. Let me think of some other ones. And um, which one? I need to, I'm trying to think of it, some other ones that I think I really like. I also think the the even though I'm I, like I like some of the Wonder Woman's powers too. I mean, she's got the the lasso of truth. Snap it on somebody and make them tell you the truth. I think that's pretty cool. Uh, right? <laughs> yeah. Why not? Oh, there's so there's so many. I mean, I, I was a big you know, Marvel's comic book guy. I think Wolverine had so many cool powers. Being able to heal himself and adamantium in his in his uh throughout his body, indestructible. Love that. I mean, but if everybody had that, then you would be out of the job, right? Yeah, I can't. Yeah, I, I unfortunately life happens, things break. People do do sometimes silly things and get injured, or do try to unfortunately have some orthopedic event or sports event that it leads them to find me. You know? Yeah, you know, like sure. I tell all the time, you don't want to know me, or don't want to need to know me, but you want to get to know me if if you need me. Absolutely. Um, favorite. So you mentioned Dragons Love Tacos too. I'm assuming you read the first one. Yep, yep we got the first one. Think- Classic children's literature, love it. Think it's great. Favorite book to read when you were a kid. Favorite book to read to your kids. Gosh. I don't have a great memory of. I'm sure I had books read to me. I just don't remember one in particular. I kind of remember. I almost think there may have been a, you know, like a Bambi or something along those lines as a kid. Okay. I do. Uh, look, I I really like. Uh, 
little blue truck and a uh, little, right. little excavator. Those are ones that I feel like uh, I've read a bunch over the year, last four years. And my kids love it. And it's one of these ones they can almost say it from start to finish without me really helping them. So yeah, good. absolutely. You used to read them so many times. They, they know all the next, the next uh, stanza. They know all the, all the little <laughs> go, go, go things. We, so um, Dr. Chip and I both have younger kids. Um, so six to just a few months old um, with your youngest. Yep, five months and, old. Yeah, nine already? No, five, five, five. five months. Months. Okay, I was like, oh, wow. Yes, five months, yep. Five months, okay. Um, but yeah, I when I was little, Mr. Dog, I loved Mr. Dog. In fact, we I took it from a parent's house and we have it here. Um, and then for the boys, anything by Byron Barton or Mo Willems. So like the Piggy books, the Piggy and Carol books. And then the newest dragons love tacos. Like the guys that wrote that book wrote um Robo Sauce. Oh Did you okay. that one. I haven't heard that. I think that's one we'll check. It's fantastic. It's got a funny twist at the end. Your boys yeah. are gonna love. It. How about have you ever read the book Doctor Dog? No, I don't think I have. Is this from your childhood? Did I just conjure up a memory? This is not from my childhood, but it is definitely a gift from the past that continues to entertain parents when you read it. So, okay, about Doctor Dog, if you have an opportunity to read the book, it's pretty silly, somewhat bad. Doctor Dog, okay. Um, your wife would kill me, but if you get the gas pass and read that to your kids, your boy will think it's hilarious. Your wife will probably kill me for suggesting that. But. <laughs> Say that again. It's, say that again. Or say, what was say that? Called the gas we pass. The gas we pass. All right. Well, that's right, that's right there with Doctor Dog. So. Okay. Yeah. I think I've heard the gas we pass. It's the best. It's the best. Um. Well, Chip, thank you so much for doing this with us. I'm and I great. thank you for doing um, this. It's a great thing to educate kids and parents and yeah, and, and, and occupations. I think it's great. Will um. We, um, so Dr. T doesn't have his book. Um, so any other questions that you have for Dr. Chip, I can just send them on his way. Um, and he What's can, Facebook? I, I should have Facebook up and run. I'm updating my website. That's one of the things that's happening now. So. Okay. Or I'll tag Mimi and she yeah, can get yeah. into it for us. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. And then we need to talk to Mimi soon about, um, real estate. She's on my list. So oh, yeah. we're going to, it's like, um, like bring a parent to work day, you know, but it's virtual and something to, to keep everybody entertained. Excellent. All right, sir. Well, good talking to you. I appreciate it. Stay healthy, sister. You too. All right. Take Bye. Bye-bye.